Two make five, and five make ten, and ten make twenty. The item on the twenty-fourth, a small insinuative clyster, preparative and gentle, to soften, moisten, and refresh the inward parts of Mr. Argon. What I like about my pharmacist, Miss Florent, is that her bills are always civil. The inward parts of Mr. Argon. All the same, Miss Florent, it is not enough to be civil. You must also be reasonable and not steal from sick people. Thirteen dollars for an enema. As I, have, <laughs> as I have told you with all due respect to you that elsewhere you have only charged me twenty dollars. And twenty dollars in the language of pharmacists means only ten dollars. <laughs> Here they are, these ten dollars. The item on the said day, a good detergent enema, Compounded of double catholicon rhubarb, honey of roses, and other ingredients, according to the prescription to scour, work, and clear out the bowels of Mr. Argon. Thirty dollars with your leave, ten dollars. <laughs> item on the set day in the evening, a julep hepatic soporiferous and somniferous. Intended to promote the sleep of Mr. Argon, $35. Oh, I do not complain of that, for it made me sleep very well. 
15, 16, 17 dollar than 50 cents. <laughs> <laughs> Item on the 25th. A good purgative and corroborative mixture, composed of fresh cassia with levantine senna and other ingredients, according to the prescription of Mr. Purgon to expel Mr. Argon's bile. Eighteen dollars? You are joking, Miss Ferrant! You must learn to be reasonable with sick people! <laughs> Put sixty dollars, if you please. Forty dollars. Item on the said day, a dose, anodyne, and astringent to make Mr. Argon sleep. Thirty dollars, ten dollars, Miss Florence. <laughs> Item on the 26th, a carminative enema to cure the flatulence of Mr. Argon. Thirty dollars. Oh, uh, item, the enema repeated in the evening as above. Thirty dollars, ten dollars, Miss Florence. Item on the 27th, a good mixture composed for the purpose of driving out the bad humors of Mr. Argon, $60, oh, yeah, oh, good $30, I am glad that you are reasonable. <laughs> Item on the 28th, a dose of clarified and a jewel curated whey to soften, lenify, temper, and refresh the blood of Mr. Argon, $20. Oh, all right, oh, yes, again. Oh, good, $10! <laughs> Item, a potion, cordial, and preservative, composed of 12 grains of the zoor, syrup of citrons and pomegranates and other ingredients, according to the prescription one hundred dollars of gently, if you will, Miss Florent. If you go on like that, no one will wish to be unwell. Be satisfied with eighty dollars. Forty dollars. Three and two are five, and five are ten, and ten are twenty. One thousand two hundred and sixty-four dollars and fifty cents. So that this month I have taken one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight syrups. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve enemas. And <laughs> last month there were twelve syrups and twenty enemas. I am not astonished, therefore, that I am not so well this month as last. I shall speak to Mr. Purgon about it so that he may set the matter right. Come, let this all be taken away. <coughs> Nobody. It's no use. I am always left alone. There is no way of keeping them here. They don't hear, and this bell doesn't make enough noise. Toinette, tingle, tingle, tingle. It's as if I didn't ring at all. You wretch, you slut. Tingle, tingle, tingle. Confound it all. The devil take you, you baggage. Tingle, tingle, tingle. Coming, coming. Yes, you egg, you wretch. Soon. Oh, this Miss Florent and 
Dr. Pergon amuse themselves finely with your body. They have a rare cash cow in you, I must say. And I would like them to tell me what disease it is you have for them to treat you. Hold your tongue, simpleton. It is not up to you to control the decrees of the profession. Ask my daughter Angelique to come here. I wish to speak to her. Oh, here she is, coming of her own accord. She must have guessed you. Oh. You come just in time. I want to speak to you. I'm perfectly here, Wait a moment. Give me my walking stick. I'll uh, come back directly. Say 
that he is a tall, though made young fellow. Uh, yes, father. Of a fine build. Yes, father. Pleasant? Yes, certainly. A good face. Oh, very good. Standing in other good family. Quite. With very good manners. Of the best possible. Uh, and speaks both Latin and Greek. Oh, that I don't know anything about. And that he will in three days be made a doctor. He, father? Yes, did he not tell you? No, indeed, who told you? Dr. Furgon. Oh. oh, does Dr. Furgon know him? <laughs> What's a question? Of course he knows him, since he is his nephew. Cleont is the nephew of Dr. Furgon. What Cleont? We are speaking about him who has asked you in marriage. But he, father. Well, he is the nephew of Dr. Furgon, and the son of his brother-in-law, Dr. Diaphorus. And this son is called Thomas Diaphorus, not Cleont. Miss Laurent and I decided upon this match this morning, and this afternoon this future son-in-law will be brought to me by his father. What is the matter? You are frightened. It is because, Father, I see that you are speaking of one person and I of another. What? What a ridiculous idea, sir. With all the wealth you possess, <laughs> you want to marry your daughter to a doctor? <laughs> what business is it of yours, you impudent hussy? Oh. <laughs> gently, gently, sir. You always begin by abuse. Can we not reason with one another without getting into a rage? Oh, come, let us speak quietly. What reason have you, if you please, for such a marriage? My reason is that seeing myself infirm and sick, mm -hmm. I wish to have a son-in-law and relatives who are doctors in order to secure their kind assistance in my illness, to have in my family the source of those remedies which are necessary to me, and to be within reach of consultations and prescriptions. Oh, very well, sir. At least that is giving a reason. And there is a certain pleasure in answering one another calmly. <laughs> but now, sir, on your conscience, do you really and truly believe that you are ill. How now? Believe that I am ill, you wretch. Believe that I am ill, you impudent bad. Oh, very well, sir. You are ill. Don't let us quarrel about that. Yes, you are very ill. I agree with you on that point. Even more ill than you think. Now, is that settled? But your daughter is to marry a husband for herself, and she is not ill. What is the use of giving her a doctor? It is for my sake that I give her this doctor, and a good daughter ought to be delighted to marry for the sake of her father's health. In truth, sir, shall I, as a friend, give you a piece of advice? What is this advice? To not think of this match. And your reason? My reason is that your daughter will not consent to it. My daughter will not consent to it? No. My daughter? Your daughter. She will tell you that she has no need for Dr. Diaphorus, nor Mr. Thomas Diaphorus, nor all the Diaphoruses in the world! But I have need of them! Besides, the match is more advantageous than you think. Dr. Diaphorus has only his son for his heir, and moreover, Dr. Purgon, who has neither wife nor child, gives all he has in favor of this match. And Dr. Purgon is a man worth $8,000 a year. He must have killed a lot of people to become so rich. <laughs> Eight thousand dollars is something without counting the property of the father. Very well, sir. But all the same, I advise you, between ourselves, to choose another husband for her. She is not of a make to become a Mrs. Diaphorus. But I will have it so. Fine. Nonsense. Don't speak like that. Don't speak like that. No. Why not? No, dear me, no, don't. And why should I not speak like that? People will say that you don't know what you're talking about. People will say all they like, but I tell you, I will have her make my promise good. I feel sure that she won't. Then I will force her to do it. <laughs> she will not do it, I tell you. She will, or I will shut her up in a convent. Ah, uh, you? I. <laughs> good. How good? You will not shut her up in a convent. I shall not shut her up in a convent. No. 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 Well, hoity toity. <laughs> Is pleasant. I shall not shut her up in a convent if I like. No, I tell you. And who shall prevent me? You yourself. Myself? You will not have the heart to do it. I shall. <laughs> you are joking. I am not joking. Fatherly love will prevent you. It will not prevent me. Oh, a little tear or two. Her arms are wrapped around you. Or my darling little papa said very tenderly, will be enough to touch your heart. All that will be useless. Oh, yes. I tell you that nothing will move me. Rubbish. You have no business.
business to say rubbish. I know you. You are naturally kind-hearted. I am not kind-hearted, and I am ill-natured what I like. Oh, gently, gently, sir. You forget that you are ill. I command her to prepare herself to take the husband I have decided on. And I decidedly forbid her to do anything of the kind. What have we come to? And what boldness is this for a scrub of a servant to speak in this way in the presence of her master? When a master does not consider what he is doing, a sensible servant has the right to correct him. Oh, impudent girl, I will kill you. It is my duty to oppose what would be a dishonor to you. Come here, come here, let me teach you. I interest myself in your affairs as I ought to, and I don't wish to see you commit any folly. You greaseful! No! I will never consent to this marriage! You good for nothing! She will never marry our child oh, by a oh, You baggage! She will sooner obey me than you! Angelique, ah! <laughs> won't you stop that grifter? No, Father, stop. You're going to make yourself ill. If you don't stop her, I'll refuse you my blessing! And I will disinherit her if she obeys you! <laughs> I am done for, you must to kill me. Oh, come near my wife. What ails you, my poor Oh, come to my aid. What is the matter, my little darling child? Oh, my love. My love. They have just put me in a rage. Alas, my poor little husband. How is that, my own dear pet? That wretch of yours, Toinette, has grown more insolent than ever. Don't excite yourself. She has put me in a rage, my dog. Gently, my child. She has been thwarting me for the past hour about everything I want to do. There, there, never mind. And she had the impudence to say that I am not ill. She is an impertinent husky. <laughs> you know, my darling, what the truth is? Yes, my dear, she is wrong. My own dear, that jade will be the death of me. Now don't, don't. She is the cause of all my bile. Don't be so angry. <laughs> <laughs> and I have asked you ever so many times to send her away. Alas, my child, when I, uh, we, uh, uh, there is no servant without defects. We are obliged at times to put up with their bad qualities on account of their good ones. The girl is skillful, careful, diligent, and above all, honest. And you know that in our days we must be careful who we bring into our home. I say, Toinette! Ma'am, now how is this? Why do you put my husband into such a passion? <laughs> Hi, ma'am. Alas, I don't know what you mean. And besides, my only aim is to please Master in everything. The deceitful girl! Uh, he only said to us that he wished to marry his daughter to the son of Dr. Diaphorus. And I told him that match was very advantageous for her, and thought that it would be better to put her in a convent. Oh, there's not much harm in that, and I think she's right. Uh, dearie, do you believe her? She is a vile girl and has said a hundred insolent things to me. Well, of course I believe you. Come, compose yourself a little. Here's your walking stick. Watch your step. Oh, <laughs> sit right here. And you, Toinette. Listen to me. If ever you make my husband angry again, I will send you away. Now, come, the rest of this robe and some pillows that it may make more comfortable than in the lounge. Oh, put your cap on over your ears. There's nothing that gives people such bad colds as letting in the air through the ears. Oh, dearie, how much obliged I am to you for all the care you take of me. <laughs> Just slip this right in. Thank you, Twin. Oh, now raise yourself a little, that I may put this behind me. This one to prop your arm up. This one on the other side. And uh, you just give this one a nice squeeze. <laughs> <laughs> and this one to keep you from the damp evening air. <laughs> Rex, you want to smother me? Oh, now, what is it now? I can hold out no longer. Oh, the wine is oh, this is She thought she was doing right. I can hold. She has altogether upset me, my dear. You don't know the damage she has done. And I told me more than eight different drug mixtures and twelve animals to put things right. Come, come, compose yourself, my love. Oh, lovey, you are my only consolation. Oh, my poor little pet. To repay you for all the love you have for me, my darling, I will, as I told you, make my will. Oh, my soul, do not let us speak of it, I beseech you. The very word will makes me die of grief. <laughs> I had asked you to 
to speak to our notary about it. I have brought her with me. She's right outside. <laughs> Let her come in, my life. Alas, my love, when a woman has a husband she loves so much, she finds it almost impossible to think of these things. Come here, Mr. Bonaparte, come here. My wife tells me, madam, that you are a very honest woman and altogether one of her friends. I have therefore asked her to speak to you about a will I wish to be made. No, oh, I cannot bear to think of it. Oh, well, she is fully explained to me your intentions, sir, and what you mean to do for her. But I must tell you that you can leave nothing to your wife by form of will. But why so? It is against local law. If we were in a state where statute law prevailed, the thing could be done. But since we're in this state, it cannot be done, and the will would be held void. The only settlement that a man and wife can leave each other is through mutual donation while they are still alive. And even then, there could be no children from this marriage or from any previous marriage of the deceased of the first that dies. It's a very ridiculous law that a husband can leave nothing to a wife whom he loves, by whom he is tenderly loved, and who takes so much care of him. But I should like to consult my own attorney to see what I can do. Oh, it is not an attorney that you must apply for. For they are very particular on this point to think it a great crime to bestow one's property contrary to the law. They are people to make difficulties and are ignorant of the bylaws of consciousness. There are others whom you may consult with advantage on that point, who have expedience for greatly overriding the law. These are the people who know how to smooth over the difficulties of an affair, without whom, well, what would become of us every day? <laughs> We must make things easy, otherwise we should do nothing and I wouldn't pay a penny for our business. My wife rightly told me, madam, that you were a very clever and honest woman. What can I do, pray, to give her my fortune and deprive my children of it? Trust me, I will do everything to serve you. But 
To serve you more effectively, I may need to change my tactics. To hide my wish to help and pretend to support the feelings of your stepmother and father. A try and let Clan know about the marriage they've decided upon? I will, and he will be delighted. Which one? I'm called away. Trust me. <laughs> I'm in love. I'm all love. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, my hands are shaking and my knees are weak. I can't seem to stand on my own two feet. Who do you think when you have such love? I'm in love. I'm all shook up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, my hands are What's a home? Yeah. Right, I'm a little mixed up and feeling fine. When I'm a little girl, that I love best. My heart beats so it stands me to death. But she touched my hand, but chill I got to do this. Like the rock hands, I'm a rock hands. 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 Right. Oh, he eats, <laughs> sleeps, drinks, just like all other folk. 
but that does not hinder him from being so very ill. Oh, quite true. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sent by your daughter's music teacher. He was obliged to go into the country for a few days, and as um, his close friend, he has asked me to come here in his place to go on with her lessons, for fear that if they were discontinued, she should uh, forget what she's already learned. Oh. Very well, call Angelique. Uh, I feel that it would be better to bring the gentleman to her room. No, make her come here. <laughs> he cannot give her a proper lesson if they're not left alone. Oh, yes, he can. Sir, it will stun you. And we should have nothing to disturb you in the state of health that you are in. Oh, no, I like music, and I should be very glad to have some played. And oh, here she is. Go and see if my wife is dressed. <coughs> <coughs> Come, my daughter, your music teacher has gone into the country, and here is the person whom he sends instead to <laughs> give you your lesson. <coughs> what is the matter? Why the surprise? Uh, oh, it is. What could bother you so much? <laughs> it is such a strange coincidence. How so? I dreamt last night that I was in the greatest trouble imaginable, and that someone exactly like this gentleman came to me. I asked him to help me, and presently he saved me from the great danger I was in. <laughs> uh, my surprise is very great upon my coming here and meeting unexpectedly him of whom I had been dreaming of all night. It is no small happiness to occupy your thoughts, whether sleeping or waking. And my delight would be great indeed if you were in any danger out of which you would think me worthy of delivering you. There is nothing I would not do for you. sir! I am of your opinion now, and I am saying all that here are Dr. Diaphorus, the father, and Mr. Diaphorus, the son. Oh, how well provided with a son-in-law you will be. You will see the best-made man in the world and most intellectual. He said two words to me, it is true, but I was struck with them. And your daughter will be delighted with him. Do not go, sir, I am about, as you see, to give my daughter in marriage, and they have just brought her future husband, whom she has not yet seen. And you do me great honor, sir, and wish me to be witness of such a pleasant interview. Uh, he is the son of a clever doctor, and the marriage will take place in four days. Very good. Please inform her music teacher of it so that he may be at the wedding. I will not fail to do so. And I invite you also. You do me too much honor. Come, make room. Here they are. Dr. Pergon has forbidden me from uncovering my head. You belong to the profession and know what would be the consequence of it if I did so. We are bound in all our visits to bring comfort to invalids and never to injure them. We I come here, sir. sir. My Great son Thomas and myself. The to declare to you <laughs> the delight we're in I the favor you do house. us. <laughs> you so kindly admitting it. us. To the honor, sir. sir. What it is to be a poor invalid, and I assure you that in all that depends on our knowledge, as well as in any other way, that we shall ne'er be ready to show you our service. Sir, 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 sir. <laughs> <laughs> now, Thomas, come forward and pay your respects. So ought I not to begin with the father? Yes. Sir! <laughs> I come to salute! Acknowledged, cherished, and revere in you a second father, but a second father to whom I owe more, I make bold to say, than to the first. The first endangered me! Engendered. Engendered me! <laughs> but you, you have chosen me. He received me by necessity, but you have accepted me by choice. What I have from him is of the body, corporal. What I hold from you is of the will, voluntary. And in so much the more as the mental faculties are above the body, in so much the more do I hold precious this future affiliation for which I come beforehand today to render you my most humble and most respectful homage. 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 <laughs> to your satisfaction, Father? Often. Come and bow to this gentleman. Oh, yes, yes. yes. Oh. Madam, 
It is with justice that heaven has given you the name of stepmother, since we see in you steps towards the perfect beauty. Lily is not my wife, but to my daughter that you are speaking. Oh, oh, oh. Well, where is she? She will soon come. Shall I wait, Father, till she comes? No. Practice the compliments to the young lady in the meantime. <laughs> <laughs> Madam, as the statue of Menon gave forth a harmonious sound when it was struck by the first rays of the sun, in like manner do I experience a sweet rapture at the apparition of the sun of your beauty, as the naturalist remarked that the flower style heliotrope always turned towards the star of day, so does my heart forever turn towards the resplendent stars of your adorable eyes as to its only pole. Suffer me then, madam, to make today on the altar of your charms an offering of a heart which longs for and is ambitious of now the reign to glory to be till death, madam, your most humble, most obedient, most faithful servant and <laughs> husband. <laughs> The gentleman does wonders, and if he is as good a doctor as he is an orator, it will be most pleasant to be one of his patients. <laughs> it will be something certainly admirable if his cures are as wonderful as his speeches. <laughs> now, quick, seats for everybody. Oh, sit down here, daughter. You see, sir, that everybody admires your son, and I think you very fortunate <laughs> in being the father to such a fine young man. Sir, it is not because I am his father, but I can boast that I have reason to be satisfied with him, and that all those who see him speak of him as a harmless youth. He has not a very lively imagination, nor that sparking wit which is found in some others, but it is this which makes him think well of his judgment, a quality required for the exercise of our profession. As a child, he was never what you call sharp or lively. <laughs> he was always gentle, peaceful, taciturn, never saying a word, <laughs> and never playing at any of those little pastimes you call children's games. It was most difficult to teach him to read, and he was nine years old before he knew his letters. <laughs> a good omen, I used to say to myself. Trees slow of growth bear the best fruit. We engrave on marble with much more difficulty than on sand, but the result is much more lasting. And that slowness of apprehension, that dullness of imagination, is a mark of sound judgment in the future. When I sent him to college, he found it hard work. But, in short, by dint of continual hammering, he at last succeeded gloriously in obtaining his degree. <laughs> and I can say with no vanity that from that time till now, there has been no student that has caused more noise than he in all the disagreements of our school. No debate passes, but he argues loudly and longly on the opposite side. He's firmly disputed and never changes his opinion and pursues an argument to the last recesses of logic. But what I'm glad to see in him, and what I'm happy to see him follow in my footsteps in, is that he's blindly attached to the opinions of the ancient world, and would never listen to the reasons and experiences of the so-called scientific discoveries of our century, especially concerning the circulation of the blood and other opinions. <laughs> I've defended a thesis against these circulators, and with the permission of this gentleman, I venture to present to the young lady the first fruits of my genius. Just, oh. Oh. This is a useless piece of furniture to me. I do not understand these things. Never mind, take it away. We will decorate our attic with it. <laughs> <laughs> of this gentleman, I invite you to come one of these days to amuse yourself by assisting at the dissection of a woman about whose body I am to give lectures. Oh, the treat will be most welcome. They are so <laughs> to get the pleasure of seeing a movie to their lady love, but a dissection 
as much more gallant. Moreover, in respect to the qualities required for marriage, I can assure you that he is all you could wish for. That his children will be strong and healthy. Oh. <laughs> Do not intend to promote him in Washington and obtain for him a post in the government there. To tell you the truth, I never had any desire to practice on the wealthy. It never seemed pleasant to me, and I found that it's better for us to confine ourselves to the ordinary public. Ordinary people are more convenient. You're responsible to nobody for your actions, and mm. as long as you follow the common rules set by the industry, there's no need to worry yourself about the results. <laughs> What's vexatious about people of a higher status is that when they're ill, they positively expect their doctors to cure them. Oh, how very absurd! How impertinent of them to ask of you doctors to cure them. Oh, you are not placed near them for that, only to receive your fees and prescribe drugs. It is up to them to get better if they can. Absolutely. <laughs> You're only required to treat people according to the rules. <laughs> sir, please make my daughter sing for our company. <clears throat> I was waiting for your command, sir. And I propose, in order to amuse the group, to sing with the young lady in operetta which has lately come out. There you go. Let me explain to you what is the scene we must sing. <clears throat> I have no voice, but in this case it is sufficient enough if I make myself understood. And you must have the goodness to excuse me because I am under the necessity of making the young lady sing. Are the verses pretty? It is really nothing but a small extemporary opera, and what you will hear is only a rhythmical prose or a kind of <laughs> irregular verse, such as passion and necessity make two people utter. Very well, let us hear. The subject of the scene is as follows. A shepherd was paying every attention to the beauties of a play when he was disturbed by a noise close to him. And on turning round, he saw a scoundrel who with insolent language was annoying a young shepherdess. He immediately espoused the cause of femininity to which all men owe homage. <laughs> And, after having chastised the brute for his insolence, he came near the shepherd to comfort her. He sees a young lady with the most beautiful eyes he has ever beheld, who is shedding tears which he thinks the most precious in the world. Alas, says he to himself, is anyone capable of insulting such charms? Where is the unfeeling wretch, the barbarous man to be found, who will not feel touched by such tears? He endeavors to stop those beautiful tears, and the lovely shepherdess takes the opportunity of thanking him for the slight service he has rendered her. But she does it in a manner so touching, so tender, and so passionate that the shepherd cannot resist it. Each word, each look is a burning shaft which penetrates his heart. Is there anyone in the world worthy of such thanks? And what will not one do? What service and what danger will not one be delighted to run to trap upon oneself, even for the moment? The touching sweetness of so grateful a heart. The whole play was acted without his paying any more attention to it. Yet he complains it was too short since the end separates him from his lovely shepherdess. <laughs> from that moment, from that first sight, he carries away with him a love which has the strength of a passion of many years. He now feels all the pains of absence and is tormented in no longer seeing what he beheld for so short a time. He tries every means to meet again with the sight so dear to him and the remembrance of which pursues him day and night. The great watch, which is kept over his shepherdess, deprives him of all the power of doing so. The violence of his passion urges him to ask in marriage the adorable beauty without whom he can no longer live. And he obtains from her the permission of doing so by means of a note he has succeeded in sending her. But 
He is told in the meantime that her father has already decided upon marrying her to another. <gasps> <laughs> and that everything is being ready to celebrate the wedding. Judge, what a cruel wound for the heart of that poor shepherd. Behold him, suffering from this mortal blow. He cannot bear the dreadful idea of seeing her he loves in the arms of another. And in his despair, he finds the means of introducing himself into the house of his shepherdess in order to learn her feelings and to hear from her the fate he must expect. There he sees everything ready for what he fears. He sees the unworthy rival whom the caprice of a father opposes to the tenderness of his love. He sees that ridiculous rival triumphant near the lovely shepherdess as if already assured of his conquest. Such a sight fills him with a wrath he can hardly master. He looks despairingly at her whom he adores, but the respect he has for her and the presence of her father prevent him from speaking, except with his eyes. <coughs> <laughs> at last, he breaks through all restraint and the greatness of his love and forces him to speak. Alas, follows. <laughs> Phyllis, to sharp will pain you, bid me fair. Break this stern silence and tell me what to fear. Disclose your thumb hearts and bid them open lie. To tell me if I live or die. Taste. 
The shepherd Tyrus is an impertinent fellow, and the shepherdess Phil is an impudent girl to speak that way in the presence of her father. Show me that sheet. And where are the words that you have just sung? This is only the music. Are you not aware, sir, that the way of writing the words with the notes themselves has been lately discovered? Has it? <laughs> Goodbye, sir. We could have done very well without your impertinent opera. I thought I should amuse you. Foolish things do not amuse, sir. Ah, uh, here is my wife, my love. Here is the son of Dr. Diaphorus. <laughs> Madam, it is with justice that heaven has given you the title of stepmother. Since we see in you. Sir, I'm delighted to have come here just in time to see you. Since we see in you. Since we see in you. Madam, you have interrupted me in the middle of my sentence and confused my memory! Keep it for another time. I wish, my dear, that you had been here just now. God damn! How about you this by not being a the second father, the statue of Memnon and the flower style heliotrope? Come, my love, and shake hands with this gentleman and pledge him your faith. Uh, father? Well, what do you mean by father? Well, I beg you not to be in such a hurry. Uh, give us time to become acquainted with one another and see grow in us that affection so necessary for a perfect union. Well, as far as I am concerned, madam, it is already full grown within me, and there is no occasion for me to wait. I am not as quick as you are, sir. I must admit that your marriage has not made enough impression on my heart. <coughs> oh, nonsense! There will be time enough to make that impression once you are married. Father, give me time, I beseech you. Marriage is a chain that should never be imposed by force, and if this gentleman is a man of honor, he should not take someone that would be his only by coercion. Nego consequentium! I can be of honor, madam, and at the same time accept you from the hands of your father. <laughs> to do violence on anyone is a strange way of setting about inspiring love. We read in the ancients, madam, that it was their custom to carry away by force from their father's house the maiden they wished to marry, <laughs> so that the lady might not seem to fly of her own consent to the arms of a man. <laughs> the ancients, sir, are the ancients, but we are modern women. The pretenses are not necessary in our age, and no marriage pleases us, we know very well how to do it without being dragged off. Uh, have a little patience, sir. If you love me, you ought to desire what I wish. Uh, certainly, madam, but without prejudice to the interests of my love. <laughs> but the greatest mark of love is to submit to the will of her who is loved. Uh, father. Oh, oh distinguo, madam. In what not regards the possession of her, Consetto, uh, but in what regards it, Nego. It is in vain to argue. This gentleman is fresh from college, and he will always have an answer for you. Why resist and refuse the glory to belonging to such a revered profession? She may have some other inclination in her head. Uh, if I had that, it would be such that reason and honor allowed. Good God, I am acting a pleasant part here. If I were you, my child, I would not force her to marry. I know very well what I would do. I know what you mean, madam, and how kind you are to me, but it may be hoped that your advice may not be fortunate enough to be followed. That is because well brought up and good children, like you, scorn to be obedient to the will of their fathers. Obedience was all very well in former times. The duty of the daughter has its limits, madam, and neither reason nor law extended to all things. Which means that your mind is all in favor of marriage, but that you will choose a husband for yourself. If my father will not give me a husband, I like the least I can do is to beg him not to force me to marry one that I can ever love. Gentlemen, I beg your pardon for all this. We all have our own ending in marriage. For my part, as I only wish to have a husband that I can love sincerely, and as I intend to dedicate my entire life to him, I feel bound, I confess, to be cautious. Uh, there are some who marry simply to free themselves by the yoke of their parents, to be at liberty, to do all they like. There are others, madam, who see in marriage only a matter of mere interest, who marry only to enrich themselves by the death of their husbands. They pass without scruple from husband to husband with an eye to their possessions, these, no doubt, madam, are not so difficult to satisfy and care little what the husband is like. You are very full of arguments today. I wonder what you mean by that. I, madam, what can I mean by what I say? Well, you are such a simpleton, my dear, that one can hardly endure it. <laughs> you wish to extract from me some rude comment, but 
I warn you, you will not have the pleasure of doing so. Your impertinence is unequal. <laughs> it is of no use, madam, you will not. And you have a ridiculous pride. <laughs> an impertinent presumption which makes you the scorn of everybody. <laughs> all is wholly really useless, madam. I shall be quiet and spite. The answer take away from you all hope in succeeding in what you wish. I shall withdraw from your presence. Listen to me! There is no middle ground. Either you will marry this gentleman, or you will go into a convent. I give you four days to consider! <laughs> Don't worry, dear, I will make her see reason. I am sorry to have to leave you, my child, but there is some important business which calls me to town. I will soon return. Uh, call upon the notary, darling, and tell her to be quick about you know what. <laughs> goodbye, my child. Oh, goodbye, my people. <sighs> How much this woman loves me, it is perfectly incredible. We shall now take our leave, sir. I beg you, sir, to tell me how I am. Thomas. Take the other arm of this gentleman, so that I may see whether he can form the right judgment on his pulse. Quidditchis. Dico, if the pulse of this gentleman is the pulse of a man who is not well. Great. Then it is dead as schools, and not to say to Very well. Irregular. Bene. And even a little caprizant. Often. Which speaks of an intemperance <laughs> and a splenetic pedensema, that is to say, the spleen. Quite right. <laughs> no, it cannot be. For Dr. Burgon says that it is my liver that is out of order. He who says Perensimus has both one and the other because of the great sympathy that exists between them through the means of the vas brevi, the pillars, and quite often of the meatus politici. He certainly orders you to eat plenty of roast meat. Oh, no, nothing but spoiled meat. Yes, yes, roast and boiled, it's all the same. He orders quite wisely. You cannot call it better hands. Sir, tell me, tell me how many grains of salt I ought to put on an egg. Six, eight, or ten, by even numbers. This is the medicines, by odd numbers. Goodbye, sir. I hope soon to have the pleasure of seeing you again. Before I go out, there is something I must make you careful of. But as I was passing before Angelique's door, I saw with her a young man who ran away as soon as he noticed me. The young man with my daughter? Yes, your little girl, Louise Hahn, who is with them, will tell you all about it. Send her here, my love. Send her here at once. Great face, girl. I no longer wonder at the resistance she showed. What do you want, Papa? My son mama told me to come to you. Yes, come here. Come nearer. Turn around and hold up your head. Look straight at me. <laughs> well? What, Papa? So? What? Have you nothing to say to me? I will, to amuse you, tell you if you'd like the story of the ass's skin or the fable of the fox and the crow, which I have learned lately. That is not what I want of you. What is it? Cunning little girl, you know exactly what I mean. No, indeed, Papa. Is that the way you obey me? What, Papa? Have I not asked you to tell me at once all you see? Yes, Papa. Have you done so? Yes, Papa, I always come and tell you all I see. Have you seen nothing today? No, Papa. No? No, Papa. Quite sure? Quite sure. Oh, indeed. This will make you see something soon. Oh, Papa! <laughs> Tell me that you saw a man in your sister's room. Papa! This will teach you to tell falsehoods. Oh, my dear Papa, don't let me. My sister would ask me not to say anything to you, but I will tell you everything. First you must be wishful lying. Then we will see to the rest. Forgive me, Papa, forgive me. No, no. My dear Papa, don't whip me. Yes, you shall, you whip. For pity's sake, Papa, don't whip me. Come, come. Well, I forgive you this once, but you must tell me everything. 
Oh, yes, dear Papa. Be sure to take great care for her. For here is my little finger, which knows everything, and it will tell me if you don't speak the truth. But, Papa, you won't tell Sister that I told you? No, no. Papa, a young man came into Sister's room while I was there. Well? I asked him what he wanted. He said that he was her music teacher. I see. Well? Then Sister came. Well? And she said to him, go away, go away, go. Good heavens, you will drive me to despair. Well? But he would not go away. But what did he say? Oh, ever so many things. What? He told her this. <sighs> And then after? Then he knelt down before her. And then? Then he kept on kissing her hands. And then? <laughs> then in my cell I came to the door and he escaped. Nothing else? No, dear Papa. Here is my little finger which says something though. Wait, stay. Uh, yes? Oh, here is my little finger which says that there is something you saw and which you do not tell me. Me. 
moment, I'll uh, come back directly. <laughs> oh, here, sir! Uh, you forget that you cannot get about without a stick. I, to be sure! Mr. Pergon does not wish to deceive. 
He is a thorough doctor from head to foot, and he believes in his cures more than all the proofs of mathematics. He would think it a crime to question him. He sees nothing obscure in medicine, nothing doubtful, nothing difficult, and with an obstinate confidence orders right and left laxatives and transfusions and hesitates at nothing. But we must bear him no ill will for the harm that he does us, for it is with the best intentions in the world that he would send you into the next world. And in killing you, he would do no more for you than he would do for his wife and his children and would do to himself if need be. It is because you have a grudge against him. But let us come to the point. What is to be done when one is ill? Nothing, brother. <laughs> Nothing? Nothing. Only rest. Nature, when we let her free, will herself gently recover from the disorder into which she has fallen. It is our anxiety and our impatience which does the mischief. Most men die of their remedies and not their diseases. Still, sister, you must acknowledge this that we can in certain things help nature. Oh, alas, brother, these are pure fancies which deceive us. At all times there have crept among men beautiful fancies which we believe in because they flatter us and because it would be good if they were true. When a doctor speaks of assisting nature and removing what is injurious to it and giving back to it the full exercise of its functions, he speaks of purifying the blood, of refreshing the bowels and the brain, of correcting the spleen, and rebuilding the lungs, and renovating the liver, and fortifying the heart, and possesses secrets wherewith to lengthen life by many years. He repeats to you the romance of medicine. But if you are to test these truths to which you are promised, you will find that they are to nothing. For it is like a beautiful dream, where you are left only in the morning the regret of having believed in them. Which means that all the knowledge in the world is contained in your brain that you think you know more than all the great doctors of our age put together. When you weigh words and actions, your great doctors are two different kinds of people. Listen to them speak, and they are the cleverest people in the world. See them work, and they are the most ignorant. Well, well, I see that you are a great doctor indeed. And I wish that some of those gentlemen were here to take up your arguments and to check your battle. I do not force upon myself, brother, to fight against modern medicine. And everyone at their own risk may believe what they will. What I say is between ourselves. And I would have liked to deliver you from the <coughs> error into which you have fallen. And to amuse you, take you to see one of Moliere's comedies on the subject. Moliere is a fine, impertinent fellow with his comedies. I think it is he disappears to go and make fun of honest people like doctors. It is not the doctors themselves he makes fun of, but the absurdity of medicine. <coughs> it is just like him to interfere with a profession. He's a nice simpleton and an impertinent fellow to laugh at consultations and prescriptions. Oh, and the nerve of Grand Valley to produce such a play. <laughs> <laughs> Outrageous! <laughs> Grand Valley is trying to corrupt the youth of America. And Dennis Henry, the director, requiring us to be off book by a, within a half, week and a half of get, first getting the script. Corrupter he is! <laughs> Not a single person of the Grand Valley Theater faculty should even be seen by a doctor and should probably be in jail. <laughs> and with Moliere. He attacks the medical profession and to show on a stage such venerable people as those gentlemen. What then would you have him show there besides the different professions of men? Princes and kings are brought there every day, and they're just as good as stop as war physicians. No, by all the devils. If I were a physician, I would be revenged on Moliere's impertinence. And when he falls ill, I would let him die without relief. In vain would he beg and pray. I would not prescribe him the least little transfusion, the least little injection. And I would tell him, die. Die like a dog. This will teach you to laugh at us doctors. <laughs> you are terribly angry with him. Yes, he is a foolish man. And if the doctors are wise, they will do what I say. He will be wiser than the doctors, for he does not ask of their help. Oh, much the worse for him if he has not access to their remedies. He has his reasons for not wanting to have anything to do with them. And he seems certain that only a strong and robust constitution can bear the remedies along with the illness. And he only has just enough strength for his sickness. What absurd reasons! Look, sister, don't speak to me any more about that man, for it makes me furious, and you will make me ill again. I will willingly cease, brother. And to change the subject, allow me to say that just because your daughter shows a slight repugnance to the natural repose is not reason enough to shut her up in a convent. In your choice of son-in-law, you should not blindly follow the anger that controls you. With such a matter, we should yield a little inclination to a daughter, since it is, after all, her life, and the whole happiness of her married life that depends on it. Ah, uh, sister, with your
your leave. And what are you going to do? To take this little enema, it will soon be done. Are you joking? Can you not spend one moment without enemas or drugs? Put it off for another time and just rest. Miss Laurent prescribed it for tonight or tomorrow morning. What right have you to interfere? How dare you go against the words of doctors and stop this gentleman from taking my enema? You are quite ridiculous to show such boldness. Get lost. It's easy to see that you're not used to speaking to people's faces. Oh. <laughs> oh, you ought not to sneer at medicine and waste my precious time. I came here for a good prescription, and I will make sure Dr. Pergon knows that I have been stopped in executing his orders. You'll see. You'll see. <laughs> Sister, I greatly fear that you will cause some misfortune here. Oh, yes, what a misfortune not to take an enema prescribed by Dr. Pergon. Sister, you speak like a woman who is quite well, but if you were in my place, you would soon change your way of speaking. It is easy to speak against medicine when one is in perfect health. But what illness do you have? You will drive me mad. But I would like you to have my illness. Then we would see if you would battle as you do. Oh, here is Dr. Pergon. I have just heard some fine news downstairs. You laugh at my prescriptions and refuse to take the remedy which I have ordered. Sir, it is not. What daring boldness. What a strange revolt of a patient against his own doctor. It is frightful. An enema which I had the pleasure of composing myself. It is not I. It was Invented and concocted according to all of the rules of art. He was wrong. And, and which was to work a marvelous effect on the intestines. <laughs> My sister. To send it back with such contempt. It was she. Such conduct is monstrous. Oh, so it is. It is a fearful outrage against medicine. She is the cause. A crime of very high treason and one which cannot be too severely punished. You are quite right. I declare to you that I break off all contact with you. It is my that, sister. That I will have no more connection with you. You will do quite right. And to end all formal association with you, here is the deed of gifts which I made out to my nephew in favor of this marriage. It is my sister who has done the mischief. To despise my enema. <laughs> Let it be brought. I will take it directly. I would have cured you in such a very short time. He doesn't deserve it. I was about to cleanse your body, to clear it of all of its toxins. Uh, my sister! I needed only a dozen purgatives or so to cleanse it entirely. And he is unworthy of your care. But since you will not be cured by me, it is not my fault. Since you have forsaken the obedience which you owe to your doctor, it cries for vengeance! <laughs> since you have declared yourself to be a rebel against the remedies which I have prescribed for you, no, 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 certainly not. I must now tell you that I give you up to your bad constitution, to the intemperament of your intestines, to the corruption of your blood, to the acrimony of your bile, to the feculence of your bad humors. It serves you right! Yes. yes, and within four days you shall fall into a completely incurable state. Mercy on me! You shall fall into a state of bradypepsia. Oh, no, Dr. Pergon! From bradypepsia into dyspepsia. Oh, Dr. Pergon! From dyspepsia into apepsy. Oh, Dr. Pergon! From apepsy into lion tree. Oh, Mr. Pergon! From lion tree into dysentery. Oh, Dr. Pergon! From dysentery to dropsy. Oh, and from dropsy to the final deprivation of your life into which your folly will bring you. Less risk. 
my constitution and how to treat me. I must admit you are greatly infatuated. You look at things with strange eyes. Sir, there's a doctor here to see you. What doctor? A doctor of medicine. I ask you who he is. I don't know who he is, but <laughs> he is just like me, as two peas. <laughs> and if I wasn't certain that my mother was an honest woman, I would say that this is a little brother that she has given me since my father's death. Let him come in. Yes. You have been served as you wish. One doctor leaves you, another comes to replace him. I greatly fear that you will cause some misfortune. Oh, you're harping upon that string again. Look here, I have on my mind all these diseases I don't understand. These diseases that I am unfamiliar with. <laughs> Allow me to come and pay my respects to you and to offer you my small services for all the transfusions and purchase that you may require. I'm greatly obliged, sir, Antoinette herself, I declare. Oh, I beg you'll excuse me one moment, sir. I forgot to give a small order to one of my servants. <laughs> Would you not say that, that, that this is really Toinette? I must admit that the resemblance is very striking, but this is not the first time we have seen this kind of thing. And history is full of those freaks of nature. Yes, for my part, I am astonished that... What did you want for me, sir? What? Well, did you not call? I know. My ears must have tingled then. Just stop here a moment and see how much this doctor is like you. <laughs> yes, indeed, but I have no time to waste. And besides, I have seen enough of him already. Had I not seen them both together, I should have believed that they were one and the same person. I have read wonderful stories of such resemblances, and in our time we have seen some that have deceived everyone. We see them everywhere, brother. You've just never realized before. On my part, I should have been deceived this time and sworn they were the same person. But Sir! <laughs> <laughs> I beg your pardon with all my heart. It is amazing. I hope you will not misunderstand me. Curiosity, I feel, to see such an illustrious patient. Mm, yeah. <laughs> Your reputation that reaches to the farthest ends of the world is my excuse for my presumptuousness. Sir, I am your servant. I see that you are looking earnestly at me. What age do you think I am? I should think of a 26 or 27 at the utmost. Ah! Oh, oh. <laughs> I am 90 years old. 90 years old? <laughs> yes! This is what the secret of my art has provided for me, to preserve me fresh and vigorous as you see. Upon <laughs> my word, a fine, youthful old fellow of 90. I am an itinerant doctor that travels from town to town, from state to state, from nation to nation, to seek out illustrious materials for my ability to find patients worthy of my attention, capable of exercising the great and noble secrets that I have discovered in medicine. <laughs> yes. I disdain to amuse myself with the small fry common complaints, such as trifling rheumatism, coughs, colds, headaches. Crap! I require diseases of importance, such as... May I, sir? Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> oh. Good sustained fevers with delirium. A good plague. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Meal confirmed dropsies. Oh, and pleurisies with inflammations of the lungs. Ooh, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I like, what I triumph in. And I wish, sir, that you had all of these diseases combined, that you had been given up despaired of by all doctors and at the point of death, so that I might have the pleasure of showing you the excellency of my remedies and the desire I have of doing you service. Mm. I am greatly obliged for the kind intentions you have towards me. Yes, yes, of course. <laughs> Let me feel your pulse. Come, come, beat properly. Da! I will soon have you beating as you should. I see that this pulse is trifling with me. It does not know me yet. Tell me, who is your doctor? Dr. Pergon. That man is not noted in my books among the great doctors. 
Oh, what does he say you are in love? He says it is the liver, and others say it is the spleen. They are a pack of ignorant blockheads. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> ah, it's you. You are suffering from the lungs. The lungs? Yes, what do you feel? From time to time, great pain in my head. The lungs. At times as this, there's, there's a mist before my eyes. Uh, the lungs. I have chest pains. The lungs. And I sometimes feel weariness in all my limbs. The lungs. And I sometimes have sharp pains in my stomachs. The lungs. <laughs> do you have a good appetite? Oh, yes, sir. The lungs. <laughs> do you enjoy into wine? Yes, sir. The lungs. Do you get sleepy after your meals and willingly enjoy a nap? Yes, sir. The lungs, the lungs, I tell you. Uh, what does your doctor order you for food? He orders me soup. Ignoramus. <laughs> Poultry. Ignoramus. Veal. Ignoramus. Broth. Ignoramus. Fresh eggs. Ignoramus. And at night a few prunes to relax the bowels. Ignoramus. And above all, to drink my wine well diluted with water. Ignorantus, ignoranta, ignorantum. You must drink your wine pure to thicken your blood, which is too thin. You must eat good fat beef, good fat pork, Dutch cheese, some gruel, rice pudding, wafers and chestnuts to make all adhere and conglutinate. Your doctor is an ass. <laughs> yes, I will send you one from my own school and come and examine you from time to time during my stay in this town. Well, you oblige me greatly. <laughs> what the deuce do you want with this arm? What? Well, if I were you, I would have it amputated on the spot. Why? Well, don't you see? It attracts all the nourishment to this side and, and hinders this side from growing. Maybe, but I have need of my arm. <gasps> you also have a right eye. I would have had plucked out of my ear. <laughs> my right eye plucked out? Yes, don't you see? It grabs the other of its nourishment. No. No, oh, believe me, have it plucked out as soon as possible. You, you will see clear in the left. No need to hurry. <laughs> Goodbye, sir. I am so sorry to leave you. But I must assist you. I'm just so excited about plucking out my eye. <laughs> Much in your way. 
Well, yes, brother. Since I must speak out on it, yes, it is your wife. I mean that I can no more bear the infatuations with your doctors than I can bear the infatuation with your wife and see you run headlong into every trap she lays for you. Ah, ma'am, do not speak so of mistress. She is a person that there is nothing to be said, a woman without deceit, and who loves master. Ah, who loves him? I can't express how much. Uh, just ask her of all the caresses she lavishes for me. Yes, indeed. And all the uneasiness my sickness causes her. Certainly. And all the care and trouble she takes about me. Quite true. Will you let me convince you and show you at once how much my mistress loves my master? Sir, let me undeceive her and show her her mistake. How? Well, my mistress will soon come back. Stretch yourself full length in your bed and pretend to be dead. You will see what grief she is in when I tell her the news. <laughs> Very well, I can say. Oh, do not leave her too long in despair, for she might die of it. Oh, trust me for that. Hide yourself in that corner. Is there no danger in counterfeiting death? No, no. What danger can there be? Only stretch yourself there. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh, here's my mistress coming back. Mind you, keep still.